Hi, and thanks so much for joining us today. I am here with uh, Adrienne Mascao, and she's a professional organizer. And we're here today to talk about some really tough topics. And I'm so glad that you're joining me today because many of you have asked over the last several weeks if you are trapped with some stuff that maybe you want to get rid of, but you don't know how, and you don't know how to work through the emotions of why you still have it and how to get from here to the next point in the process of dealing with it, how do you do that? Now, there's a renowned professional organizer here in front of us today that has committed to spending an hour of her time with us to answer some of our questions about those really difficult conversations that we are challenged with. And so please jump into the comments, please ask your questions, and let's see if we can maybe look at things from a different perspective. Because if you've been struggling with stuff that you've inherited from mom or dad or grandma, or maybe it's your child that's moved away from home, or maybe even a child that's passed on, how do we deal with those things that are tied up in our homes and they become a part of our lives because they're part of our emotions? So let's get our questions answered and let's take a different look, maybe from a side or maybe a perspective that we haven't seen before that might shed some new insights into maybe our progress. So please help me welcome Adrian Mascao. How are you today? Thank you so much, Angela. I'm great. I'm so honored to be here. Well, you're on a mission, and it's a really interesting mission that's helped a lot of people. And can you share with us a little bit about your process when dealing with people who are, let's say, overcoming grief? Yes, absolutely. So my business started a little over six years ago out of a deep season of grief for myself. My my mom had passed away and probably about six or seven months after she passed, it really dawned on me how needed uh, that transitional support was around the time that she passed. Um, I am happy to share more later, but there was an instance I was asked to do something the day after she had died. And of course, I was willing to help, but just because we should doesn't mean, or just because we can doesn't mean we should. And so I started Blythe Professional Organizing really with a heart to be able to meet people in transitional times. So whether it's been a lot loss of, loss of a loved one, um, if it is even some people don't think about this, but when a pet passes away, just all the things that are in your home that you don't think about that you are then having to go around and take care of when someone like us can come in and really support you during that um, really emotionally, sometimes traumatizing time. And uh, going through a divorce, having to move out of a home that you've lived in for 30, 40 years, um, the support of being able to help not only the, the individuals moving out of that home, but also the families, the children that are trying to be really tactful and loving with helping their parents, moving them into maybe an assisted living, but they don't want to go. And so having a company like mine come in and really with a heart of empathy, support people through that whole entire process. And empathy is at the heart of your business. Absolutely. What, what is it about empathy that decide that you decided my business is going to be based around empathy because that's that's a, a huge commitment for a lot of people and it takes a very special set of skills mm -hmm. it does well i say it's because it's like who i am as a human and so i think that that is what i was brought onto this earth to be able to offer a lot of people because of the capacity that i have and the team um, that I have, I'm based out in Nashville, Tennessee right now, but I started my business in Portland, Oregon. So I have a team in Portland, Oregon. I have a team here and then we can travel to wherever you are. Um, but both, both teams, when I choose individuals to um, really champion this heart of empathy, I, I think it's so much more about the client than it is about the actual space. So we can look at a room that is filled with things and say, okay, yes, we can organize this space. But if it is not connecting to the client, how we go about organizing or asking curiosity questions, that room is going to come back to the same exact state. 
maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe a year later. And I want, I want this, I want holistic organizing to be something that is a new model that will be sustainable for people because it connects with them individually versus a kind of cookie cutter mold of what has been shown. And I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of the cookie cutter molds that we see is somebody bounces in on a job and they organize everything based on color scheme and your closet mm -hmm. looks Pinterest worthy and then they leave. Mm -hmm. And then a month later, everything is all disheveled and it's not color coordinated anymore. And the process doesn't stick. It was just mm -hmm. nice to take pictures of and then show to all your friends. And now it doesn't look like that anymore. Sure. And we, we live in a world that is so curated and we live in a world that tells us that's how it should be. And one of the things I talk about often is um, the word should or someone telling you it should look like this or yes, have the rainbows or buy more. You should have this piece for this room more, more, more. I think should is this kind of could cloaked in shame. Mm. So I really think that there is so much shame in telling people, oh, you should do this. And it's not really something that they own for themselves. So being able to come in and say, I want to know how, how we got here. Tell me, tell me and help me understand what are the things that are creating anxiety? What are the things that for your family, you feel when you walk into the house, you feel out of control or you feel this sense of, I can't believe it's gotten to this place. And so kind of working back versus bulldozing through, which that that works, there's a result. But again, I don't think that it is going to be um, an actual change to their lifestyle. And that's why I think the empathy part of what we do at Blythe is so unique because clients that I've worked with years now are saying things like this literally has changed my life and and they are able to own it for themselves in in a whole i mean some of the sessions that i have are weeks at a time but if i'm flying to a different uh location uh for a client i have a very small window of time to support them and then i'm gone and normally it's like once a year that i'm able to see them so all that other you know, time that I am not there, I'm amazed at what I come back to and how great it looks and how they've kept it up. So is there a difference then between a traditional organizing approach and a holistic organizing approach? Uh, great question, <laughs> Angela. I think there is. I think uh, holistic organization, like I said, is much more about getting to the root of where the client and the individual is versus walking into the space and saying, I can organize this and doing it. So I think it's more human focused than the space focused. You know, it's interesting when we talk about organization, when we talk about understanding why we do what we do, lots of people don't even understand why. I mean, they just do things because that's the way they've always done them. There never was a moment where they stopped and they took a look from all the different angles and go, huh, I wonder why I do this this way, right? Absolutely. And I think what you said about should is really interesting. Should cloaked is, is could cloaked in shame. And I love that. I've never heard that before that way. And I love that because I think a lot of people are afraid. If I look at why I'm doing some of the things I'm doing, then I would, I would find things maybe I don't want to see. Yes. And instead of looking at it as, oh my goodness, I'm afraid of what I might find about myself. What if we were to take a look at it and say, hey, wait a minute, there are some interesting discoveries here I might find that mm -hmm. will then forever change the way that I look at the way that I purchase things, the way yes. that I store things, the way that I use things, the way that things are presented in my home, either for practicality or function versus mm -hmm. just looks like for me in my personal home, the little cool looking little bins that have the labels on them. They don't they do not work for me. I need yes. a clear plastic bin that I can see through with my eyes and I yes. can see how tall or how full it is <laughs> Yes, because if it's empty and it's laundry, I know that it's about time for me to do clothes again. Totally. Right? I mean, yes, is, visually like you're able to see it. Well, for me, it's based on practicality and mm -hmm. I've 
I've decided for me, this is one of my own discoveries, that I should not ever take pictures of my closet on Pinterest because they will never be Pinterest worthy. <laughs> yeah, and and I wanna speak to that. And that's where I think we live in such a society that really pushes that it has to look like Pinterest. And piles do not define me. I People ask me all the time as an organizer, is your home perfect, immaculate? And you can ask anyone that knows me that it is not. And it's not a, a you know, a mess at all. It's very livable. But when, when this is what I tell clients often, if I want my goal with this company and anyone that we serve, because I truly, that's how I see this is being able to serve people in places that are really vulnerable. It, it's, it's, they've gotten to a point where it's almost like this desperation of I need help. And asking for help is really uh, courageous. It's really hard to do. And if you, um, anyone that goes to my website, you'll see the whole heart and nature of it is all about being courageous, bravery, asking for help and support. Because once we finally do that, it's 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 that first breath of being able to release and be like, oh, okay, I have someone here to help me. And so it makes such a world of difference. So. Piles do not define me, and I'll give a little personal background as to why. Growing up, I had a mom that piles did define her, and I had a very, very constricting home. It looked perfect. It was the baskets with the labels, and everything had a home, and it was like something you'd see out of a magazine or Pinterest, like we're talking about, but it did not feel like home. It did not feel like a livable space to grow up in. Now, is that part of why I am innately able to do what I do? Possibly. Um, because I look at clutter and it does not overwhelm me. It excites me in the sense of, I know that we can get to the bottom of this. I know where this little pile goes and create homes for them. But not every pile or, or those homes are going to be the same. What, what is true for me is going to be very different for you. So asking someone about, I call it, I call it the clock method. If you've had a clock on a wall for years and years, and I come in as a professional organizer and say, I think that clock should be on this wall now. And you're like, oh, she's a professional. This is great. I, okay. Sounds good. But then we move that clock and every single day you're going to go into that room and look on the wall where it's always been. And that is not functional or sustainable for you. Just because someone says this is, again, how it should be, to me, it, it's, it's the freedom of knowing you get to choose. But if the, if the disorganization or the clutter is keeping you from living your fullest life, that's what we want to get to the heart of. If you want to make a meal and have a beautiful dinner at your kitchen table, but it is covered constantly, we want to declutter that kitchen table so you can sit down with your family and have a meal that you've been wanting to have. Like kind of setting those goals and understanding what is it that you really want in your space? What what is what are some goals that you have and and making tangible steps to get clients to that point? And I know that in setting goals, saying let's say for example having dinner with your family, there are a lot of people that are working through issues right now that are even tripping up that process, and it might be working through things like grief. I know that my husband just lost his dad a couple of weeks ago, and when so, I speak to his mother, thank you. When I speak to his mother, I ask her, "How are you doing?" And she says, it seems really surreal, like it hasn't set in yet. Mm -hmm. And she said, so I'm trying to get as much stuff done as I can right now while I'm in this frame of mind. Because she yeah. said, when it hits me, I'm afraid I'm going to become paralyzed. Yep. And yeah. I think there are a lot of people, I know there are a lot of people that have joined us here before that have questions about they have lost a loved one, a parent or a spouse or a child, and the years have passed. And after that surreal moment, passes and you're like, okay, you know, I've been hurrying and trying to, you know, get the funeral ready and serve the family and get the family out of town and all these things just in order to catch your breath. When you catch your breath, you don't come back up for air. 
And many people are like, what, what now? Now that I've had a chance to, to be alone with my grief, mm -hmm. what now? And a lot of people don't know what the next steps are. Sure. Yeah. And with grief, it to me is the waves of there, there is no path there. There is no, this is the way that you need to go and it will get you to a better state. There, there's just, there's no path. And I think what I've seen the most and working with people uh, very, very soon around a loss is there's such a fragility there. And it, it's, um, I want to say the right words in this moment, to take the utmost care of what that individual is going through is essential. And what happens after loss, and this was my experience, my, I'll share this because I think it's a, it's a really good re like it shares, tells you why I started my business. But I asked my stepfather, my mom had just died and I asked my stepfather, how can I help her? Is there something I can do? Again, I'm asking this the day after my mom died, which is a huge part of who I am, but I just felt that feeling, like you said, of your mother-in-law of, I got to do it now because I don't, I don't know how I'm going to feel even in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And he asked me if I would um, go into her bathroom and clean out her vanity. And um, I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time. So this is not a home that I was in often. Uh, so to walk into her bathroom and to think about where she stood and getting ready in the morning and all, all that she would do, what those drawers would hold and the weight of each drawer that I opened, it's, it's nothing like you ever can prepare yourself for. You can't, you, you just can't prepare yourself. And so I remember walking in the bathroom, agreeing to this and just needing to take a moment. And she had, uh, they had built the entire house around her clawfoot tub. She was like the most planner of all things, but she loved her baths and she literally planned where her tub would be to look out at the view um, here in Tennessee. And I just closed the door and I was like, I, I don't know if I can do this. And so I just took the time. And I think that that is what I would encourage people is even with timelines of having to get everything out of the house or family members pressuring you to get it done or um, money is always just a huge stressor around anyone passing and not wanting to lose and really honoring that individual. But to take a moment to breathe and really take make sure that you're taking care of yourself in that loss. And so I did. I The tub was not filled, but I just curled up in that tub and I looked out of, of that view and I just had this moment of being able to honor my mom and then step into helping my stepfather with the um, containerizing of what was in those drawers. And so when whoever's listening, if you have lost someone or are going through that, you have support. And, I, and that's a huge part of what Blythe offers is being able to very much relate personally, um, but also the team, this team that I've built is able to come in and really listen to what you need and guide. And I, I believe that's one of the hardest parts of this is people literally are in shock. They, they have had someone in their life and then it's the absence of that person. And so the void that's there is really real and trying to um, look in a room and find paperwork to, to someone that you just lost is one of the most daunting things. So we even, we've had one client that just told us all the paperwork that they needed us to find um, in their father's office. And we were able to go in and find all of those versus them having to go sort through all this paperwork um, while grieving. So mm -hmm. those are just some a couple of helpful steps that uh, just to encourage people in that season of not knowing what to do. And it's okay. 
that you don't know what to do, um, but you have support. Can we talk about all the stuff for a minute about that? I mean, everybody has paperwork, everybody has websites, everybody has logins and passwords and things mm -hmm. that need to be documented somewhere so that in the event that something does happen, your relatives or your next of kin are not left stranded hiring a team to sort through that stuff or break into a computer as it is and try to unlock passwords and hidden things because they don't they don't know how to log in. Yeah. Um, can you speak to some of the steps that that people right now can take right now to ease that process for their relatives so that there isn't a bunch of heart heartbreak and wondering was there an insurance policy and where's the information and which company yes. is it with and all those things. Yes, absolutely. So um, one of the first steps is just start. <laughs> start with something that feels doable. I, a lot of people look at preparing for death as this, I don't want to talk about it. I don't, I don't want to go there, but it is one of the kindest, most loving things that you can do for the people that will be left that will be alive to take care and really honor everything um, that was your life. Um, I think about it often when um, we, we accumulate and bring new things into our home. A lot of times people don't understand the value or the purpose of something that means a lot to us. So I'm gonna give two suggestions. One is if there is something that is extremely sentimental that you know you want your daughter to have, or you know that you want your son to have, or you know your sister loved this sweater that you always want and you want to make sure that she has it when you're gone, write a little note card. If it's a piece of furniture or something, put a post-it note under it and in your will say, everyone, everyone gets this piece. Look, look underneath the chair and you'll, you'll see your name and who gets it. There's really creative ways to almost, I know it said that's why my website is blithe.fun, but it's making organization fun that it can be so daunting and challenging to see everything as a whole. But if you can just start and you're walking into your living room and you look at that beautiful frame either even um, that you know, oh, I know that my my niece would love that frame because she's really into gold or this or that. Just write it down and start making it a habit as you're walking around your house to just take note. Um, the other story I'll tell is I have a dear friend here in Nashville that we enjoy going to pawn shops and finding really beautiful pieces um, of gold or diamonds or things. And uh, she has four boys. So she always thinks about, I have all these beautiful rings and yet my boys probably won't really care about these unless they have you know, a fiance someday that they want to give this to. But what she realized is she has pieces that were her mother's. She has pieces that were her grandmother's. And when she's gotten something at the pawn shop versus these pieces that are so sentimental and special to their heritage, like these stories that these boys in high school are not going to really like remember if mom shares that story right now. So she and I talked about her having whether it's a Ziploc bag or a little note card or a description or taking a photo so that um, it is logged each ring or piece that she notes. This is a pawn shop ring. It has no sentimental value. It's, if y'all want to sell it, melt it down, go for it. Um, but the others have the story behind it. And that story is something when people pass away, it is most always and I say that because not, not to be um, depressing, but a lot of stories are lost. Mm -hmm. There's so many stories I wish I'd asked my grandmother and my great aunt about that I'm like, I vaguely remember them talking about this and maybe in the photo album. And it's like I'm trying to piece together all these stories that I don't know because I didn't ask them or I just wasn't in a place in life to really 
care or understand, which is so unfortunate. But that's the the gap between age sometimes is once you get to the age and they're gone, that story is lost. And so mm -hmm. writing it down, whether it's keeping a journal, um, having a really good will that you just it's like a thing that you, you you brush your teeth and you add to the will or like there's some mm -hmm. some sort of habit that you have that while you are alive you're able to love people and that the the people that you love in that way and then also um i had a great aunt b and she had really great quotes and she used to always say to me adrian the Wells Fargo wagon isn't going to be trailing behind my hearse. And it was basically saying she's not taking any of this with her. And so she was one of the most generous humans I knew and generous in things like a beautiful ring that I cherish and love with all my heart that I know. I know the story behind it because she gave it to me when she was alive. So just being able to let go of things now versus waiting until you're gone. And I think that's a really important element that a lot of us overlook. When we start thinking about what can I get rid of and what can I sort through? Mm -hmm. I think some of the most important things that we need to really consider is what do I have to give while I'm here on the earth? And can I yes. give that while I'm here on the earth? Yes. And I know one of the, the things that really hit me this last year was I have a dad who is just an amazing human. He's been a mentor to me as long as I've been alive and incredibly wise. He was always very mm -hmm. quiet and never spoke much. But when he did speak, you wanted to take notes about everything that he said. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I thought to myself how sad it would be should he leave the earth and us not capture that. Because like you mm -hmm. said, once it's gone and that person mm -hmm. has left our life, a lot of those stories, they don't transcend the generations. They just kind of stop with the generation that's left behind and then those stories drift away. And I said, what would it take for us to be able to capture those ideas and wisdom while he's alive right now? And yes. Believe it or not, I talked him into doing a podcast with me. Yes. He's like, oh, no, 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 I, I, I don't want to do a podcast. And I said, it's not for you. It's for all the it's kids and all the grandkids. Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, I could do it for them. And he wouldn't do it yeah. for himself. But yeah. he said he would do it for the kids and the grandkids. Yeah. So every Saturday morning we meet for one hour. Oh, and he, he wrote, he put all of his ideas together in a book and we helped him publish the book. But the book we go through and there's one topic. And if you were like the best parent on earth or the best leader, yeah. you would have these certain leadership skills. And wow. now I'm, I'm one of 19 kids and many people would love to know how do you raise 19 kids, right? Oh. So I get to ask him these questions from an insider's perspective, like, hey, check this out. How did you do this? Like, how did yeah. you express common sense through all these kids at different multiple ages uh -huh. as you're raising them? And so his insights are fascinating, mm -hmm. but we're actually putting this on tape. When he leaves the earth, he's not going to leave behind a lot of wealth. But what yeah. he will leave behind are these cherished memories yes. and words of wisdom yes. that then will transcend time and space. Absolutely. And so I started for myself saying, okay, all this stuff can mm -hmm. go away. Cause like you, your aunt said, you don't take it with you when you mm -hmm. go, mm -hmm. but what difference can I make today? And I want to, I, I, I love that you brought this up mm -hmm. and I want to encourage each one of our audience members today to mm -hmm. stop and think for a second, what is your value mm -hmm. here on this planet? And what are you doing to capture that so that you can share it before you leave? Mm -hmm. Because if you've left all that, the goodness that you brought to the earth is, is then now just a memory. Yeah. And instead of us getting caught up in our stuff, what is our purpose? And can we leave that behind and let it leave a mark so that we've, we've really blessed the lives of other people? Yes. So I'm really glad you brought that up. I just love this. Yeah. So and that is such a beautiful, like, I love that you had the insight of what your dad was gifting to you on such a, almost an emotional level of like heart, heart space with him that you were able to say, I, I want this. And I, and I think we don't think in that way because we think those people are going to be with us for a long time. And for me, I, um, I'm 40 years old and I, uh, my mom passed away at 55. And so mm -hmm. it was a very, I thought my mom would be around much longer than what we had her. 
on this earth for. And so I think being able to have that insight of, hey, I know you don't want to do this, but this is not just about you. This is about grandkids and all these people that now you will be able to like for lifetimes after your life live on in a way that is so much more, um, yeah, that connection is so much deeper. So I love that. And just the book and all of that. I want to, I want to talk to you more about that at some point. Um, well, my grandmother, my mom's mom lived with my family for the last 14 years of her life through dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah. And it's possible. And I hate to say this and I don't want to be the one to like drop the hammer or anything, but what happens if we're still alive Mm -hmm. and yet we're not able to contribute in a way that we once were. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't think it's just leaving the earth. I think it's, do you have all your cognitive faculties about you? And if the answer is yes, now is the time to make that, that move. Yeah. And I I know for me, you, you talked earlier about do go as, do as you go. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking about that because one of the things I started doing is saying, if I'm paying a bill today and I were the last one to ever pay this bill and someone came after me and had to pay this bill, how would they find this bill? Mm, is so this good. bill inside a, a security vault where there's a password <laughs> and it's logged onto an account? Totally. Auto pay and how is it paid? Right. And I started looking at my bills differently. Mm-hmm. And so I do have a keeper. We use keeper security, which is a password vault. Yeah. And when you log in, you can log into that account and you only need the one password and it unlocks the whole vault okay. and all the passwords are stored in That's the vault. Amazing. But what's cool is this. And I marked down, this is how this bill is paid in the last four digits of the credit card number that pays mm-hmm. this bill every single month on this certain day. And it is triggered by this. And if I buy like a new piece of software, I will say this software was purchased on December 12th of 2023. It was purchased from this company. Here is the login information to the website. Here's the support information. If I have a glitch and I have to call customer service, here is the license code to the software. And this is the computer. Like I named my computers like um, Savvy Cleaner 1, Savvy Cleaner 2, Savvy Cleaner 3. Like this is installed on Savvy Cleaner 3 computer, like this license. In the event that the computer goes bad or we have to wipe it or start over again, this is the software that goes on this computer. And that way, if something happened to me today, Mm -hmm. someone else could come in and they could pick up right where I left off. Absolutely. And so my question then is, what do we have to do just in terms of, and I didn't do it overnight. This is like you say, as you go, but just stopping for a second and say, wait a second. If I'm the, if I'm the last one that comes through this door. (laughs) Yeah. Is it clear what my intentions were? Is it clear what happens next and where where people find this? Sure. And I think majority of people would say, uh, even just this conversation would create anxiety of like, oh my gosh, there's so many things, right? Like there's so much that they have not done that. And I think it's just thinking about how, if I was passing this off, how would I want this to be passed off to me? So mm-hmm. thinking in a, in again, kind of role reversal of thinking about if if I was going to give this to you, Angela, I would want to be able to communicate to you like this is this bill and I, I actually pay it this often instead mm-hmm. of this. And any details, like you said, taking note of that and documenting it in a way that is, um, do you know the author Brene Brown? Yes, by chance. So one of her sayings that I love and I live by is clear is kind. And Mm -hmm. so having clear communication, whether in written or verbal or nonverbal, is being able to have it uh, be kind. And I think that's one of the kindest things that you could do to anyone that is, um, yeah, if we were gone today, how, how clear would it be and how kind would it be to the people coming in and kind of picking up or as you've passed it off. And that's one example I had. I was really raised by my grandmother and my great aunt and my aunt B. Everything you could ask her the most random tool or piece of paper or documentation. And she would say it's in the, at my desk, 
left drawer to the probably towards the back of the files or everything had a home and um when she passed she had everything in order i was just telling a dear friend about the story the other day and as christmas time comes it's this is a season of a lot of grief of when when my loved ones um passed away and my aunt b had the wherewithal to have me wrap christmas presents in the summer and i didn't understand it i thought that she had more time with us but she passed away um the day after thanksgiving and um she had i think it was her power of attorney or someone um i received a note in the mail from my aunt b after she had passed and it was instructions she had given to him to send it to me after she passed and she said Adrian, wow. all those presents that you helped me wrap, I would love for you to hand deliver them on Christmas Day. And it gets me really emotional. But it was the sweetest thing to be able to open those Christmas gifts from her with all of us. And we cried and we laughed and it was just so sweet. So not even thinking on a scale of Christmas. So I don't want people to feel they have to be in this doom and gloom of I could die any any day. It's just she was sick and she knew her time was coming to an end. And she, to me, did one of the sweetest, most kind uh, things for us as a family to actually feel her there um, on Christmas Day when it was the first Christmas, very recent, not even like a month um, since she had been gone. And those are the little things that you can make it your own. It doesn't have to be this, this is how it looks or, um, gosh, I have to add this to my list now. I think mm -hmm. it really needs to work again for the individual of what really um, supports them and how they, like, like we said, how they want to pass it off to, I, I think it's almost like this last step of, honoring who you, who you are too. It's like this very sweet way to honor and give back and say, I'm always with you. I'm still here. Like, this is this sweet thing that I knew that you would love and enjoy and appreciate. And, um, and that's part of like, I want to tie this in. It's part of why this is so rewarding for, me and my team to help people in these moments because you you we can relate that it is such a difficult time but if those things are in place and it, it alleviates so much so going into a space that has had no preparation is a very different home and environment than one that has even just a little bit. And when you talk about a little bit, I want to highlight that for a second, because a little bit of preparation can build on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to get organized overnight. Mm -hmm. But if you do a little something today, and then you follow through with that, and you do a little something again tomorrow, like every time if you pay a bill and you track, like, yep. hey, this is, this is the bill, then what happens is the next bill and the next bill and the next bill, and over a period of time, your affairs start to become in order. It's yep. not something that has to happen overnight. Overnight, nope. But I know for myself, and I don't want to be ugly or anything, but I will just be nope. for a second. Sure. I, I'm not coming back. I do not have any time anywhere in my future, in my yeah. head, where I'm going to come back and I'm going to have this great big chunk of free time. And yeah. I'm going to be able to sit down and like start organizing stuff and going through stuff. And that is never going to happen for me. I'll just tell you right now, yeah. not going to happen, <laughs> not ever. Okay. So if I do a little piece today and a little piece, like when I have a minute and if something's in the microwave and I can do something for two minutes, yay. Mm -hmm. If I can do something while I'm on hold on the phone and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've got the speaker on and I can move around my office here and I can tidy something up there. Yay. Right. I mean, if I can do it in little tiny bits, yay. Yeah. But there's never, there is never going to be a chunk of time where I, I'm like, all right. So I am doing this it. is the day. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to happen ever. Yeah. And so I think I think what you're saying about do what you can and mm -hmm. do little bits of it and let it build on top of each other is a brilliant idea because I, I am one of those people. 
Yeah. Well, and it's realistic. I think when we look at something as a whole and like, okay, I have to do all of this. We're never going to do it because it's not realistic with the lives, the lives that we live. So um, it would be great to be able to just have like weeks at a time to t dive into a project. But that's also why having a professional organizer, having even just a family member, someone that I have a best friend um, that she, I had to go through this garage and I was in a moving process and I was feeling really stuck getting it done. And she's like, I'm going to come work remotely tomorrow and you're going to work on the garage. And just having her physically in my space was accountability. And it was so much support. She didn't help me pick up a thing, which is totally fine. She was working. She told me what she was going to be doing, but it was so supportive to have her there because I was dedicating that time that she was there to really focus on that. So if there are bigger chunks of time that you know that you have and you can welcome someone into that space with you, it can make such a big difference in, um, yeah, just ha having that support. And again, like I'm all about making things fun. Um, put put on some of your favorite music. I love candles. I, I will light a candle and um, say, okay, I'm going to spend 20 minutes doing this. And if that's all I have, again, there's absolutely no shame in that's all you have for that day. But um, focusing more on the things that you have done and accomplished than all the things that you have not. Because that's what I see a lot with clients is they give me just a list of all the things that, well, I haven't done this. And then there's this room and I, I see the mountain that they are trying to climb. And I'm like, let's just go down this little path <laughs> and start there versus trying to climb. And, and then they're like, I can't do it. And they stop and they and they stay in that cycle. Um, Angela, I'm going to close this a bit because the sun is starting to rise. Give sure. Just a second to close this. Uh, while she's doing that, I want to say hi to all you guys. It's super exciting to have you here. Hi, Muppet. Um, I'm so glad that you joined me every single time we have these sessions together. Thank you so much. It just brings me so much joy. And I really appreciate you guys uh, jumping in and saying hi. Uh, we've got Fran Thompson. So, hey, Fran, good to see you here today. We've got Mariah Lee. She says she loves the clawfoot bath. That is Hi, so awesome. Mariah. We've got Janice. And Janice says, Adrian is one of my favorite people in the world. My oh. dear friend, we hired her to help us clean out my mother's home of 48 years. Mm. It was extremely sad and overwhelming. Adrian lightened the load in an incredible uh, and indescribable way. I get tears listening to her here. Please have her tell you the dress story. Wow. <laughs> I love this. And thank you, Janice, for, for sharing that with us. Oh. And Margaret says hi. Hi, hi you guys. Margaret. It's so good to have you here. <laughs> All right. Now we have to hear the dress story. Okay. So. Here's the dress story. Um, the sun is just going to be part. Actually, the sun is a huge part. It's a joy. I'm Sicilian. So this is like, it's just going to be part of, of this podcast. Um, the dress story. So, uh, Janice, I I um, was able to meet Janice years ago when I was living in Portland, Oregon, and she has a wonderful sister um, named Caver. Um, hi, Caver. Whenever you listen to this, but I was able to uh, meet their mom and know her before she passed away, which is really rare for me to uh, when I work with clients to know the family members that have um, passed, uh, before. Um, so, um, this home, they pretty much were in a space of needing to just gut it and get rid of everything. So there were some things that were very personal to them that they wanted to keep. And they were kind of making piles for each, uh, family. And, um, I think Janice in particular said this one room, just pull everything out of the room. Everything is going. So I follow instructions well, and I'm going through this closet and I come to this piece, this article of clothing. And it reminded me of an article of clothing that my aunt B had. And it was kind of like those old smocks to where um, they would wear it over 
clothing to cook or clean. It had this cute little, I think like a checkered pockets um, on the front. It had some stains. It was definitely looked loved on. And it just was kind of, I call it a ping. It was like, I looked at it and thought, this seems like a really special piece. I'm going to ask just to make sure. So I come out in the hall and I said, hey, um, is this something? And I can't even get the words out. And Janice is like, oh my gosh, Caver, Adrian found it. Like Adrian found moms. And I, I guess they call it a dress, but it was the the piece of clothing that their mom would wear every single time, every single time she cooked in the kitchen. And they had searched and searched for it. And they were like, I guess she threw it away. Or I guess, cause that was that one piece that really represented their mom to them. And so those are those types of things that I had no idea, but I was intuitive enough to not look at it like, oh, here's this blouse and here's this piece. And there was just something connected to it. And that's another thing I would like to say is I think a lot of objects hold a lot of energy or emotion or personal uh, stories for people. And if someone, an organizer is coming through just bulldozing through your house, not really thinking about a handwritten note or something that's dated or, um, I mean, I've found wedding rings and things that people are like, we have been looking for this for decades and you found it. And um, that's what happens when you finally go through spaces that have been untouched for a while too, is it really unearths um, a lot. So that's the dress story. Janice, thank you <laughs> for bringing that's, that up. That's so sweet. Such a beautiful it was a very, story. it was, we were all like in tears because uh, it, it honored their sweet mom and it felt like she was there, like with us. So it was very special. Well, and Janice sounds like one of the lucky people that when you get on an airplane and you fly out to see that person, you get to spend physical time with them. Yes. And I know some people are not that lucky and they, they get to hire you remotely. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the remote process. I know that you said on the first session, you don't let people clean and you mm -hmm. have a, a discovery call. Tell yes. me a little bit about what that is and how somebody might get started working with you if they're really hesitant and they know they need help, but they don't know what they need and they're kind of scared to ask for help or they've been caught in that could cloaked in should. Yep. 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 So that, that shame. Um, so uh, when I offer virtual organizing to people, sometimes I even, it could be someone that's local that just is not comfortable. It, it really came up during COVID as well. Um, but it's, a time like with COVID, people didn't want you to come into their physical space and it made a lot of sense. But it was also a moment to recognize a lot of people can do this on their own. Um, professional organizing, I, I want to state too, is I, I want it to be accessible for everyone. And I think it has been painted as a very elite and kind of um, a, a service that is a luxury. And it is um, for sure. But I think there's a way in which anyone can be supported and virtual organizing is absolutely available to you. So how it is set up is if um, I'm meeting with a new client, all they need is a, a camera, basically their phone or their laptop. Uh, we talk first meet them, talk first about what is it in their space that is really the hang up? Like what are, what are they struggling with? What um, are the day to day? What's their day to day lifestyle? Kids, they live on their own animals, just kind of getting to know what I would normally be coming into a space seeing. I, I, I need them to kind of let me into that space um, of their lifestyle. So once I get to know them, then they show me their actual space. So they will walk around their space and show me the the closet or the pantry or a kid's room that maybe does not have any systems that they do not know where to start. And then I come up with a game plan. So this whole um, session is recorded. So they are able to listen back to what I've shared. Um, they can 
rewatch over and over again to have those tools or the things that I've communicated to them. And then um, the next step is uh, having another session where sometimes on that first session, I give them homework or sometimes I create a game plan. And then the next session is when we actually start. Some clients want to do that with me. So it's almost as if I'm with them and they're like, what about something like this? And we kind of go through and it's not piece by piece, but it, it, um, it, it's, a lot of people think it will be, I call it clunky. It's not. It has been the, one of the most fluid things because each client is able to just kind of let go and be like, okay, I'm in here and this is what this is happening. It's like, like you're consulting, but from afar. And clients get really excited about it because they can instantly see and they're empowered to do it on their own, but with the support of a professional organizer. And so when you say, and I know you said earlier that you have clients that you've worked with for years, mm -hmm. the average time, is there an average time or is it really just different for every person of from the time that they first call you to the time that let's say they're organized and their home is clean, or is it just an ongoing process based on uncovering element by element and working through each of those issues? So it, it, that's a great question. It really depends on the project and the client. I have clients that are on a, a, almost a hoarder um, scale of just the home, even on an emotional getting started, takes so much more time to even um, one client, it took three sessions for him to allow me into his space. So there's that um, client that we support and work with. And then there's clients that aren't even there they want the project done in two days. They've purchased this certain amount of hours and we do all that we can do in that time. And that's that. And a lot of times when we work with clients on a time frame, uh, then they see what we can do in that amount of time and they will hire us back to do another area of their house. So I think it's it's such a trusting relationship to be um, welcomed into someone's home. It's, it's, I say that all the time to be allowed into that space is one of the biggest honors. Um, so the clients that then leave codes or doors or things open for us to come and do our services. That is, we've built that relationship and trust over time. So the clients I've had for years, um, it sometimes is a once a year, a once a year, almost touching base and dialing back in the projects we've already done. I was telling you the one client in, um, or before we came on air, um, who's in Juneau, Alaska, and she hires me um, once or twice a year. And to see the progress and what she has sustained in her space, I'm like her cheerleader all the time. I'm like, look at this. It's It looks untouched. And she's like, I've really been working on it. And she feels so proud of her space versus before. It was um, almost a, a, just a really daunting space that was a lot of grief and um, chaos, anxiety, struggle for her that she she doesn't feel anymore. What advice would you give to someone who feels like they're not worthy of a professional house cleaning? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you are worthy is what I would say. I We are all worthy and deserving of support. We, no matter uh, where you are in life, what your background is, um, that is how I would respond to that. And then also, I think I really appreciate that question because I think we all struggle with deservingness of, well, why, why should I get to have this? And, um, I, I flip it again. This is, I guess, how my brain works, Angela, but I flip it to think um, I love giving gifts and I love supporting people. So why would I not give myself that same love and gift and honor that I so freely give to others? And so I think it's 
the the heart of organization to me and the service that we are able to give to people every day is this ultimate reflection of self-care and self-love of let's make sure inside your house is taken care of before you're going out into the world and taking care of all these other things. Um, and when people start to do that, they can breathe e easier. A lot of clients will want me to focus a lot on the main areas of their house, but the areas that they actually dwell in, like their bedrooms, are one of the spaces that are the least touched. And yet that's where you're laying down at night and it's where you're rising. And so I will ask clients, what is the area that's created? Well, kind of my bedroom, but that's fine. Like nobody sees that. And it's about <laughs> other people. Yeah. And I'm like, I understand. I understand no one sees that, but I, I want this to be the space that you see is just as important as all these, all these other spaces in your home. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was that person. I had okay. my office cramped in this tiny, little, tiny bedroom in my house because it was just my space. And yeah. I said, well, I don't deserve to have like all the rest of the house. I got this huge house. And then one day I woke up and I said, wait a second, all day, every day I spent in this one little tiny room. Yeah. I should have the biggest room of the house be my yeah. office so that I can really use it for what it's designed to do. Absolutely. And I moved out all my weight equipment because I had this great big, really nice weight room in my house. I moved yeah. all the weight room equipment out. And I said, look at all the space now that's going to be mine. And I, I really just gave myself permission in a really arrogant sort of way to say, if I'm if I'm better and I'm using all this space, I'm going to be able to serve other people better because Absolutely. I'm not cramped and I'm not like stuff stuffs on top of each other because there's not enough room. There's going to be enough room because I've got plenty of space. And here you go. Yes. And I think I think by spreading out, I became more efficient and more mm -hmm. effective and more mm -hmm. creative. Yes. And I really want to highlight the fact of something you just said a second ago, because I mm -hmm. don't want this hour to slip away without us <laughs> highlighting this. And it goes back to this thought that Adrian just said about you can't take care of all the other people out there until you take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. And it's so incredible because we do. I've noticed this through the 32 years that I've been in people's homes cleaning every mm -hmm. single day. This I've noticed. The mm -hmm. people that are the most creative, that have the most amount of stuff and crafts and all the things inside their home are the people that would give you their shirt off their backs. They're yeah. the most giving, kind, considerate people you'll ever meet. They're the people that are out there literally blessing the lives of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And they come home and they're like, oh, I'm just so tired. I just can't do it for myself. I'm just going to yeah. collapse and I'll just throw this towel or shirt or whatever it is over the top of this chair. I'll deal with it tomorrow, which they never do. Yeah. But they say, I'll take care of everyone else first. I'll take care of me last. And mm -hmm. if you take care of me first, you can then take care of everyone else so Absolutely. much better. Yes. Yeah. And I, I heard the word when you said, um, you know, kind of arrogant. And I think that that's something that, kind of lean into those words that we've told ourselves like you taking care of yourself is the most loving thing you can do for others not only yourself but for others because when we are depleted when we are empty people feel that and so your space your bedroom that uh, vanity in your bathroom, maybe when you get ready every day and you're setting yourself up for a day of success or being a busy mom, loving your kids or uh, wh whatever the case may be, whatever your story is, knowing that you have things in place, that you feel this sense of confidence and um, your room, when you wake up, you're like, ah, oh, you can breathe versus like, get me out of here. <laughs> like that is really, that, that is that mental part of, uh, your space is connected to you. And so just thinking it doesn't define you, but think of, think about the areas within your home that you choose to not do anything with and just ask yourself why, why is that? And um, giving yourself that permission to kind of like figure that part out. And most always it, it comes back to like a not really taking care of what is needed for you. 
So I want to thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thanks for all your beautiful questions. Well, we've talked about some really honest stuff, but I want to leave our audience with one thing. And that's something you said that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And you said you are worthy of living in a clean space and you are worthy of support. And I want to encourage you guys to really think about that as you go about your, your business over the next few days. If you are worthy, because uh, Adrienne just gave you permission. She yes. just said you are worthy. You're worthy <laughs> of a clean space and you're worthy of support getting there. What does that mean? And what does that look like for you? Mm-hmm. And if that's true, and I believe it is, what does that mean for you? Yes. Oh, this was so good. I hate oh, that. Our time is over. Tell our listeners where they can go to find you. So you can find me on Instagram at whyhello.blythe, so um, B-L-Y-T-H-E, and then my website is um, there on the screen, but it's www.blythe.fun because we are having fun while organizing. Um, Yeah, those are the two best places you can find me, and um, within my website, you can submit any questions that you have, any projects and that you need all the services that we provide. And I encourage you guys to get in touch with Adrienne. She's a loving, supportive person. And as Janice says, she's one of the dearest people on earth. And Uh so thank you, Janice, for the vote of confidence. (laughs) I second it. I think that's amazing. But uh, I do do want you guys to stay in touch because there's there's a lot going on here that can really help us take a deeper look at the life that we were really meant to live. Hmm. So true. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a great week and we'll talk to you soon.